Hi everybody, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, you're here for a dark dive into security and risk. And what I said before, if I would be Paul McKenna, I would say that you know I could make you take risk and save your stakeholders some lives. So who am I? Uh, it was quite interesting when Callum Wilson just before me mentioned that you know one of the worst set you know devices in your home could be set to boxes. I used to work in electronics and repair set to boxes. I'm, uh, as I sometimes say, the Forrest Gump of Scottish cyber. I've been everywhere, done quite a lot of stuff, been in academia, worked from all major banks. I inspired the crypto professor to do crypto. I worked with Jamie Graves, who is now running Zonefox. And uh, some most recent things, I also helped to ensure the security of the core components of the R3 Corda, which is uh, if you're interested in some distributed stuff. So, been there, done that. I don't have any t-shirts. Most of the companies only gave me cards. Bit boring. Uh, in this talk, uh, I do understand zero-day chat. I do a lot of technical things. I love talking about it. But guess what? Not everybody likes talking about it. And often, things that we care about, you know, as a tech security forum, I left it behind. Somebody puts them somewhere on additional bit of the document. So, so what people actually care about is the exact summary. That's what you left with. So if you want to get something, that's where you need to get it. So just to make sure, I'm going to be talking about some things that have happened in the past. And if you recognize the company I'm talking about, it's because you were there. So don't share. It's all going to be fine. So. What is the problem today in security? I've been to a few talks today already. I heard some messages that was talking about breaches. Facebook doesn't care. Those people don't care. Just business doesn't care that much. And, and you know, how do we make them care a little bit about? So imagine you've got the pen test results are out now. You've got the recommendation you need to get a new piece of kit into your organization or somebody is going to take it over. You, you know, you, you just get it into your mind. If without that piece of kit, it could be a flux capacitor, by the way, you're not going to get out alive. So what are you going to do? How are you going to get it from your stakeholders? Are you going to do nothing? You know, add it to annual budget? Unlikely. It's usually too small to actually run the costs for the year. You can wait for a nice project to come along and ask them, or you can steal plutonium from Libyans and sell it on. I often use that. In the past, I basically waited for a big enough project to come along. Whenever they would go into the transformation cycle, eventually they would head, hit one of the security gates, and I would be like, you know, guys, if you're not doing if you're not going to do that, you can't go ahead. You can't deliver your project. The best I got out of it, I actually managed to get a tactical SIM installed for 1.2 million pounds in one of the banks. I'm quite glad with that. But it's not things I'm proud of because at the same time, I'm the blocker. If I'm a security guy saying, guys, you're not going to go past planning or you know, you're not going to get to the execution if you don't invest 1.2 million right now towards the end of your project. I'm the bad guy. I'm, I'm the, you know, it feels bad. And you, you can't really overshare it. So, you know, it would be nice if obviously stakeholders would get us near the, when they talk, start talking about the vision, where they want to go with the company, but they don't do it. Often security is the thing that is at the back. So, and it's, I had a few examples in the past as well. So, some stories I remember. At one stage, uh, one of the stakeholders in the bank, actually they didn't come to us, somebody just sent us a little email saying, guys, that area in the bank is doing something risky, you know, go and speak to them. By the way, when I take a bank, it means any bank, I work in most of the banks in Scotland. So when, when somebody says that area is doing something risky, we go and speak to them. It's like, yeah, don't worry, it's, we're not changing anything. So basically when clients have problems to get online, they phone us up and they want to get a statement or something or account balance. 
we just say, oh, you know, you could do it all online. We're going to take you through the process. So they take all the security details on the phone. They ask people, what password would you like? They take it over the phone. doesn't matter. The colleagues get recorded. And then they say to the customer, yeah, yeah, you can use now online banking. So, yeah, I had a problem talking to those stakeholders and telling them, guys, there's something wrong about it. So it turns out our common sense is not the common sense that the business stakeholders have. How can we fix it? If, if we don't have a common sense, then maybe there's something else we've got in common. So, you know, business likes to talk about money, customer satisfaction, press releases, and some other fluff, you know, some nice pictures, maybe feelings of people, sales, sales speeches. Security, on the other hand, yeah, we've got some nice talk. We talk about secure by design, SQL injection, password complexity. Great. It's nice. It's, I like that chat. But those guys don't get it. You know, and, and we've got some fluff as well. We've got nice pie charts. Our dashboards on our new theme actually has a lovely pie chart. If you want to see it, I'll show you that. One thing we actually have in common is risk. You know, business guys talk about risk every day. At least monthly, they need to look at the finance and credit risks, and they have also mandatory risks. They have plenty of risks to worry about. So I literally they talk in that language, and, and we talk about risks. But when we talk about it, we want to stop people taking risks. When they talk about risk, they want to take risks. That's how you make money in a business. You don't make money by sitting at home and being wrapping yourself in a you know in a doobie and hoping everything's gonna be good. That's not how you make money. As a business, you go out there, take a risk to be the first in the market or something else, whatever your domain is, and that's how you make money. So how do we go about fixing? There is a disconnect about how we talk. We're even talking about the same thing, but we're looking at it from wrong perspective or different perspectives. So where I want to tell you or take you today is how myself, a risk-averse person, become a cave diver and relate it to a lot of things we do in security. So if you can imagine going diving is actually a great sport. For me, I can't do meditation. I just, you know, tried, I failed. That's my meditation. You know, like I can go there with a bunch of friends, go under the water, listen to myself breathing in and out, look into the world around, be a visitor there, and relax. Nobody can call me. Nobody can talk to me. I can wave to them. It's like, oh, up, okay, down. It's fine. It's, it's nice and relaxing sport. But there are some risks, especially if you practice cave diving. So that's a mine in the pipe, just across the floor. That's my body stop going ahead of me. As you can see, his ability is not that good already, but then he just uses his skin a little bit stronger and the cloud fast comes up. It can become a blackout within a second. And actually, this dive was quite a good, nice visibility dive. So it was quite a nice and relaxing experience for me as well. If you get claustrophobic already, that's how I used to get there. But I now enjoy it. So what is it that when, I, when most people see something like that, careful risk, that's what security guys now say to the business, like careful risk, you don't go there, something bad gonna happen. I see a nice recre recreational area. That's, that's what's behind that fence. There is a huge quarry flooded. Nobody dived before me and my body. It's actually quite nice, quiet, nobody's there. I enjoy it. So. So how do we get people to see that, that different side? And because I'm now talking to the security crowd, I'm taking this view that security could maybe follow rather than the business. And I think we can meet in the middle. So first of all, how risky is it? You find out that if somebody is cave trained, it's you know one out of 300,000 dives end up being a fatality or causing a fatality. Normal diving? One out of 200,000 dives, somebody dies. If you run a marathon, it's one out of 100,000. So to you guys, if you're running a marathon, I salute you. It's a risky business. It is. 
So don't think that cave diving is hard, it's not, it's all good, so you can join us. <laughs> and obviously driving is far more dangerous, and, and the, like, the one that I like on the bottom right, it's actually something I feel strong about, is sharks. People are scared of sharks, but actually you're more likely to die of flu or stroke or cancer than tiny, tiny risk of being bitten by a shark. So think about it. So if we get statistics wrong, and if we get perception of the risk wrong in our heads, is it that we only get it about you know other things? Maybe when we talk about work, we're much better. Come on, we're security guys and girls. We're gonna have to be better in this one. So in 2018, what was the most likely file carrying malware? And I don't want you to shout, raise your hands or anything. Let's do it a mentally style. Think to yourself one of those answers. Okay? I hope some of you were surprised, because that's the point of it. Most people are now talking about office. There is big scare of, you know, office files carrying malware. Yes, there may be a newer wave. There is, they are in the news. But actually, JavaScript files always carried malware, and they still carry malware, and they still majority of malware. So maybe some other statistics. You may have been involved in one of those ransomware incident. How long will it last? You've detected a ransomware incident. It's not hard. You've got a ransom on your screen. How long it usually takes a company to recover? Again, think the answer to yourself. You know, you've got backups. You've got everything. How long it will take you to recover? On average, it's 7.3 days, and it usually costs a company about 64, 65 thousand dollars. These are the stats from a company called Coveware, and actually quite, quite like their statistics. The bad one they got, they say that malware or ransomware got so bad, or good, that now you've got 95 chance of recovering your files if you pay them. In the past I would never advise people to pay, I still don't advise people to pay, but 95% chance of recovering your files if you pay? That's pretty good software. Okay, so the perception of risk is all over the place. You know, people are scared of terrorist attacks, but the risk is actually tiny. You know, that's on the bottom, it's actual risk. On the top is how people are worried about it. Everybody talks about, you know, terrorist attacks, plane crashes. But actually, you are more of a risk of, you know, if you're having a glass of wine a day, that's more likely to be a cause of your death rather than a terrorist attack. So, uh, here's another one for you. Have you heard in the, the last three months that most of the attacks on organization, or most of the malware into the organization is carried by the email, is coming through email? Like, that's a stat I've seen all over the place. 90% 90 of everything is carried by email. No, this was a Verizon stack. The statistics about APT it had nothing to do with malware, but people that sell DLP tools and other tools are now using it to advertise and saying, come on, get our tools, everything is coming through email. It's still remote desktop protocols that gets people. You'll be surprised in 2018, 19. So tune in your perception of risk. Know what's around you. And then get back to, you know, why cave diving is not so dangerous. You know, we, we still haven't seen the data. Is it, is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? How did it got to that point? And Conan Doyle had a nice thing is, you know, until you really look at the data, you shouldn't get any theories about it. So in the 70s, it was a very risky sport. Many people died. Actually, you know, 30, 30 people per year would die cave diving. And then something happened. Science like that would be put up in Mexico and Florida uh, to warn people about danger and also put trainings about. And the reason was because somebody done accident analysis. They found out that most people that died were actually, it could be families or it could be just recreational divers. In the 70s, the scuba gear got quite cheap, so they all could go and dive. They would start diving into a nice little stream. It's open water diving, so you can surface anytime you want and get a nice breath of air. And then they would go a little bit into the caves because they're right next to the streams. Oh, that was all right, came back. Oh, next week we're going to go a bit deeper. It's like, it's, it's an easy thing, cave diving. Come on, it's not scary at all. We'll get a bit deeper, deeper every week. 
And, you know, they would get overconfident and actually die because of something. They would get to the point where we're, as our businesses, they would, you know, you speak to the business and say, why should I do something that you're telling me about? I've been operating for the past three years. Nothing has happened. And it's the same kind of, you know, reaction. So, so how was it fixed? The, there was a proper accident analysis done. People started to care about equipment, awareness, training, state of mind of somebody going diving, skills, and learn from their mistakes every time you go into the cave. But, you know, you look at it and it's like, it's pretty much like any framework for trying to defend yourself. This one is, is the old mist. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. If you've got a problem, if you want to defend yourself against something going wrong, you can use one of many methodologies, but as long as you go and stick to it, you'll be fine. So when you're defending yourself, try to work in phases. Identify what could go wrong, protect yourself against it, detect when something starts to go wrong, respond and recover. So what, how does it translate to things? But you know, do it to proper level. You know, somebody may die at the end of it. Maybe in the company, is the company going to die. So what kills a cave diver? Out of those four, it's overconfidence that is most likely to kill them. As I said before, you know, out of people that die, you'll notice that that's a graph showing how many people had cave diving qualifications. 143 of them didn't have any cave diving qualifications. The people that actually bothered and done some training, you were pretty right. Not that many of them died. But I want you to go further. Whenever you're trying to say to somebody what's going to happen, what is the wrong thing that's going to happen to your company or your business or your colleagues at work or the customers, I want you to go further and think, you know, what's there? You know, obviously, when we talk about loss of visibility, that can cause an accident Entanglement, yes, I can die because of it after maybe half an hour, but then panic again. But when I'm diving, what's going to kill me is a lack of air or water in my lungs. And the same with the companies. They're not going to die because of a data breach. And I think you've seen some examples this morning from, from other people showing how many breaches Facebook went through and other organizations went through, and they're still alive. They're fine. So what kills a company? So you probably heard about it. In 2017, Maersk, one of the biggest shipment company, or actually the biggest shipment company in the world, was hit by Nopetia. And you know, after that incident, they had to patch what 4,000 servers, 45,000 PCs had to be redone. They've been done for 10 days. Nothing operated. So all those ships were out on the sea waiting to go in the ports because they couldn't unload. Everything was okay with the ships. They couldn't unload the cargo because the system wasn't telling people where to put the cargo. The trucks would actually queue up outside the ports and block the major highways. Everybody was aware of it. They couldn't do anything about it. So, no, but, so what happened to Maersk? We, we had some people today saying, oh, the share price may drop. Yes, it will drop for a very short while. It's not going to drop for long. In Maersk, that's the day, the vertical line there is the day when they actually been hit with NotPetya. They're in similar time that they had in 2016. They've got now between 2018 and 19. I don't see that much difference. They didn't die because of it. Maersk will continue to operate. They will be fine. But if you would say, to Maersk guys, you know, you could save yourself 300 million by not connecting one of your machines to the network, the machine where you're using the software from Ukraine that's going to get automatically patched by whoever, you know, somebody you don't trust. They would probably say, yes, don't put that machine on the network. Maybe pay for it 100 pounds or 200 pounds to get it secured. So talk about risk. Cambridge Analytica, that was a, a nice one as well. They they didn't get breached. They were the breach. You probably heard about them. They actually, if, if we're looking at Brexit or Donald Trump winning the election, they probably had something to do with it just because they manipulated people's minds through Facebook and other sources. They died. They've been outed last, last year. Channel 4 ran a documentary about them. 
that company is no longer around, not because of a breach, no long, but because they ran out of money. They ran out of money defending themselves from the press. And also their servers were taken by the ICO, so they couldn't operate. If they would have more money, they would continue to operate. There was another element there as well. Companies like Cambridge Analytica depend on somebody, a key supplier like Facebook, with data. If you cut them away from that supplier, they're dependent. So if you're a bank, for example, and you've got millions of customers, and you don't have one single supplier that can take you down, what happens if you've got a bridge? No, you cannot survive. Your share price may drop for five days. It will cost you, but not that much. There was another case of Rocky. Rocky was a brilliant one, and I hope you, 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 you actually know about them. So if you've been to any password cracking lectures or anything like that, you may have heard about Rocky. They were the original password load that got outed on the internet. Before 2009, everybody thought that people were quite clever with their passwords. They actually had proper random passwords. But, you know, one hacker with the acronym IS, ISIS, I, he, he was able to execute an SQL injection on their website and be able to get all the password data from the website. And what was nice, he, he kind of made it public that, you know, Roku is not safe. So Roku said, oh, we've now patched our systems. Everything is fine. People don't panic. But they, they weren't honest with people. So, you know, the attacker kind of thought, no, nah, they need to do something about it. So he thought what best he can do. He actually took 32 million passwords and outed them to the internet with no username. So the security industry learned a lot from it. They, they actually, if you know about people using password 1234 or something, it's because of that breach. They were the first one that got breached. And what, what happened to them? That happened 2009, 2010. They were still operating. They like had to uh, fire about half of their staff. But up until, I think, last month, they were still operating. They didn't die. That organization did not die. So if you're going and saying to your stakeholders, come on, if you don't patch this system, there's going to be a huge massive data breach and you're, comp you're going to lose all your customers. That's probably not exactly true. You need to be specific. If you are telling your people that, and you need to know what your company is dependent on. So Roku again, they were depending on Facebook. Facebook could turn down the tap and MySpace. They could turn down the tap any time. And that's what happened. That's why they actually had to hire half of you know, staff. So what kills companies? They lack cash. They order to close trading, bad press, or a breach. But it's different for everybody. You need to understand the business you're helping. Don't just tell them it's a breach. That's going to kill you. It means you don't understand the business. You don't understand the risk. It means you don't know how the people you're working with make money. Okay. So identify, know your business, what does it need to survive? And then protect yourself. You know, in, in cave diving, we, we, we know we're going to have to carry two bottles of air. If, if I know I can easily die because I run out, out of air, I can only keep my breath for 30 seconds. I sometimes find myself half an hour in into a deep mine. You know, how do I get out alive if something happens? I need to have a backup. So we always carry two bottles of air. We've got two separate regulators. If we need to separate the bottles, we've got the manifold at the back, which we can just turn down, shut down, and have two distinct systems. If I go into a tight cave, I've got another system where I keep the bottles on the side. I can take them both off, put them in front of me, and be, okay, I'm never going to be slim to go past many obstacles, but still as slim as I can get to an obstacle. And sometimes the best kit you can get is not a diving kit. I think that's a lifesaver. One of the mines we explore, we need to walk about a quarter of a mile. So I think that's the best kit we ever got is a four by four quad that gets us to the place. I don't get to the place out of breath. But what I want you to think about is, you know, when you're trying to protect yourself and now you know what can kill you, get the right tools for the job. And surely you know that at least one or two horror stories of what people buy when they're given money or when they told that something needs to be changed. One of them, you know, I remember an organization that was told, you need to get correlation between 
uh, password checkouts, and what is a privileged activity. And they went through looking to a few different SIM tools, and at the end of it, they come out with two, and that was ages ago, it was about eight, ten years ago, they come out with QRadar and Splunk. Problem with Splunk was, it didn't have a security label back in the day. And also, the sales guy from the States didn't really want to travel to UK because it's as much a small island. You know, it was a small market for them. Curator could not do correlation at all. But the sales guy, was, yeah, they were happy to travel. It's free travel. Come on, it's uh, eight hours in. They can talk to, to that organization. <laughs> Obviously, the bank, that was a bank. They went for Curator. And that's where I wrote my first, cor or checked my first correlation rules in Perl, outside of the SIM tool, because the only way you could do correlation was to take the logs out of the SIM tool for the night from two different batches, compare them in Perl, put it back into the SIM tool, and see the exceptions the next morning. And you think to yourself, how much money does it waste every day? How much life you're wasting because you got the wrong tool for a job? And in security, if you get something wrong, be brave enough to say that, or think about the strategy, how you're going to get it better. So things like that, I'm sure you've got plenty of those horror stories from your organizations. I worked with a few of you before, and I know a few of those horror stories. So get the right tools for the job. And then you need to detect that something is getting wrong. You know, so. If you think about diving accident, actually diving accident often starts at home or on the journey to your dive site. It does not start in down in the cave. It starts with maybe your mindset, maybe something happened on the way, maybe it's just not your day. One of the cases, there was a guy who was on the boat in Scapa Flow, one of the beautiful areas up in Scotland, and you know he had a little fall on the boat. Obviously, we've got like 40 kilos of equipment on our backs. So he got up, shake himself. He's like, yeah, it's okay. Show to the skipper. I'm fine, skipper. And skipper thought, she looks all right. Let him dive. He went dive down. He was planning a deep dive to 60 meters. He never surfaced. And it was because of that little fall that he had. Something happened to his arm. He couldn't operate things that he should be able to operate. And actually, Skipper would go to jail if not for the fact he did not organize the trip. He was just helping some buddies go on the boat. So, think about how you detect those little signals telling you that something may go wrong, and how do you filter them that you also don't waste time and look at too much noise. Tesco Bank was an interesting case in 2016. I'm sure that you heard about them. There's plenty of banks like them as well, so they're not my target in here. But if you think about them, they had a breach. Uh, they, somebody worked out how to do the CDV codes on their cards. And, you know, they only lost 2.2 million pounds in fraud at that breach. So they could compensate all the clients. But obviously that was pretty, thing, pretty uncomfortable situations for the client to find out they've been losing money and somebody been defrauding their accounts. So, uh, Actually, they've been fined 60 million pounds for that event. And when you read the accident analysis, it turns out that the fraud guys knew on Friday evening that something is going wrong. And they keep emailing that little inbox saying, you know, we think something is going wrong, you should look into it. Second line, please look into it. And guess what? Second line was away for the weekend. They didn't check the email. Somebody did not check the process. And for 21 hours, nobody actually started responding to the event. Just 21 hours before somebody done a change to prevent that fraud. From the time they actually detected. And I'm sure that they've detected at least few hours, if not more, after the fraud started happening. So get those signals early. Teach people to be open and honest. In diving, if I've got a bad feeling about today, you know, I may have driven 300 miles. I may have paid a few hundred pounds to get onto a boat. But if I say, guys, I'm not diving today, nobody's going to question me. And the same in your organization. If somebody sticks their hands up and say, guys, I think something's wrong here, go investigate, check it. And if it's nothing big, then tell them, okay, good, thank you for telling us. 
this is not big because of that, that, and that. So next time you've got something like that, think about those things. If it, you think you're still worried, come back to us. So get those early warnings. So don't ignore the little things. And then how do you train to respond? In diving, on the left-hand side, that's how you learn to scuba dive and do your mask clearing. You're on the bottom of the pool, you've got two hands on your mask, and you're trying to blow in the mask to actually get the, the water out of your mask. When you're cave diving, on the left-hand side, you need to think about things. You've got a helmet, you've got a line. If you lose the line and you can't see it, you're not going to know which way to go, where it's out of the cave. So you need to grab it, you need to get the mask out with your one hand, swap it for another one, because your mask is obviously broken, and and you tr and you are suspended in water, you can't land on the bottom, because the seal is just going to cover things. So think about how we train when we do cyber incidents. Oh, we do desktop desk exercises. We go and meet people and they talk how well they are prepared. They, we told them about that exercise a month ahead. So obviously they've done their homework, but at least their secretary done their homework and they've got all the documents ready for the desktop exercise. One, one nice thing that I, I, I've seen before, one of the consultants I worked with before, his way of checking whether a company can pick, it, pick, pick itself up and whether the crisis team is up to a scratch, he waits for a planned fire drill and after the fire drills, he taps, taps on the shoulders of the crisis management team and says, okay guys and girls, that's you, whatever you've got with you, we're taking you to a hotel and you're now recovering the company. It's much harder to do it. And then that reminds me of another client that when I went there and done an inspection, whether they actually prepared for any kind of a physical crisis, they say, don't worry about it. Every one of our employees has a laptop. If something happens, they can take those laptops home, we check, we've got enough licenses for them to connect remotely, they can do everything remotely. Okay? So we turn up at the office at 6 a.m. the next morning. What did we find? Laptops. On every single desk. How are you going to recover from burning building if your workstations and how people connect remotely to your work are on desks and people don't have them? It's not a strategy. So train as it is real life. Have fun. Talking about it, are you capable of responding 24-7? Because at one stage last year I learned I'm not. I went to Gozo to do my, you know, one of my cave trainings. I've done a few now. And on the first day of a course, I had my mask pulled off me. And that's the first time I think I felt like I may actually die doing it. I felt like I'm being waterboarded. So the, the thing about trying to clear your mask, especially when somebody pulls it off, is that yeah, you can have water getting into your nose and stuff like that. If you have been on a flight the previous night, you only got to your hotel at 3 a.m. in the morning, and you've been all, of, all morning training other things, didn't have lunch, and then you end up in the water and in a risky scenario, I actually had to stop that exercise and say, guys, no, that's me today, or for this one, put my stuff back on, but I was down on the bottom of the cave and just say, no, no more today. And if you think about your responders, you know, I, I read some LinkedIn statuses and it's like, oh guys, it's so hard being a security guy. We've been here, oh, 5 a.m. or maybe 6 o'clock, uh, it's so late and we're still working. And that's when you're not being attacked? And you're telling the world you're a security bot somewhere out there, wherever you are, and you're knackered on a normal day? You're an easy target. Just somebody knocks you off a little bit. You don't have any strength to defend yourself. A normal SOC analyst can probably analyze something for about five to six hours. There will studies done maximum. After that, they either need to go home, get their pizza, have a walk, or something like that. So, you are not able to be ready 24-7. Prepare your teams for it. An average person works 40 hours a week. Get your teams organized around it. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> there are three times of life. 
timelines, lives, timelines, and statistics. We talked about statistics before. Uh, so when you're trying to recover from anything, and when you're trying to do anything, try to get the right benchmarks. I've been to so many clients that say, oh, we, lose, we look at industry data. The industry data is telling us that. And we also talk to other people, and they tell us that something like that is happening in their environments. And then I go to them and say, so what is happening in your company? Where is your data? Where is your attack data? Where is the data that tells me how many times you've been breached, how many records you lost, how much money your company lost at the back of it? It doesn't matter that you lost, you know, maybe 100 records. If you lost 100 records in 2018, I want to know what was the impact on that organization. I want to know what you've done with that and whether you learned anything. But keep it as a data point somewhere. And so many people try to look outside for a solution. At least half of the work is inside your organization, is analyzing what you've got. So to summarize all that, these are the points that I covered. And it would be far too easy if I just left it at that. You know, it's, yeah. Analyze the problems you've got, think how your company can die and get start from there. But that's easy said. How do we go about it? Some lessons are quite old, to be honest. On the left, one of the best cave diving books ever written. It was written in the 70s, 40 years ago. It's still as valid as then. On the right, a book that was written in or released in 1936. And if you're a consultant, I advise you to read it. I've been told about this book 11 years ago. I had not read it. I thought, oh, it's about cheating people. No, it's not about cheating people. It's about how to be nice and understand other people's perspectives and get to understand them and help them. So if you're trying to help somebody, if you're a security guy consulting, speaking to people, go and read it for the right reason, just because you want to understand other people and the way they see the world. So, and also, we're on the defensive side. We're not attacking anybody. We're not a business trying to do something. There is that myth that you need a strong leader everywhere. You need strong leader to take you to the moon, let's say. You need strong leader to be on the offensive side, to attack somebody. On the defensive side, as I said before, one person can only cover you for 40 hours a week. You need a strong team of people helping each other, talking to each other. If you've got risk function in your company, you've got audit function in your company, and you're a security person, don't go to the business without speaking to those guys. If you go to the business and say, you need to do that, the risk person says, no, no, you surely can't do that. And the audit has a third perspective, and you expect the business to be the responsible adult, given that they don't have a clue about security, you're doing it wrong. Go and speak to everybody you can, and go and build a herd, you know, a team of people that like to have fun, that actually like to do something interesting. So, I will say before, if you practice something for 10,000 hours, you're going to become a world class at it. But you can't do the same old boring thing every single time. What you need to do, you need to get better and better at it. So in here, it's me with the blindfold trying to get myself out of a cave. I didn't know I get lost. I need to find the positions I am. I can't just try to navigate it and, and wing it because I may be going deeper in a cave. So I need to know a position I'm in. So you practice harder and harder every time you do something. And, you know, at this time, I was going to tell you about the final exercise I've been doing is you Two people are blindfolded, trying to get out of the cave because we simulate zero visibility there. I'm now running out of air. I've been tapping my head, it means I don't have any more air. We need to, I need to get air from that guy and get out. And I was going to say that if you practice hard, get a crowd of people like-minded and actually have fun with them in security and other things, you can do amazing stuff. Life actually is, 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 is better than, than me planning it, 
Do you remember the, the Thai boys getting stuck in a cave last year? There was 12 Thai boys in their coats got stuck in a cave. And one, one guy that came to the rescue was called, called Josh Bratchley. And, and that guy, last week, last Tuesday, but, you know, never returned from a dive. He was with the buddies exploring some new caves. They came out, he wasn't there. They called 911. The, the cave rescue team came out. His buddies couldn't get him. They were exhausted. They didn't have air. They weren't silly enough to go back in. They called 911 and waited for them to arrive. 24 hours later, those guys, you know, are instructing the cave rescue team saying, you know, we know Josh. If he got into trouble, he would try to get to the safest place he's in. He's already 24 hours in a cave. There is a place where he could potentially have survived for 24 hours, but it's through some narrow and dangerous passage. And, you know, the rescuers were into the cave at 6, eight, six o'clock in the afternoon. 15 minutes later, that guy came out himself. They just gave him air. He came out and just asked for pizza and thank everybody involved. Next day, he was back in the cave. And it's because he practiced these 10,000 hours in hardened and hardened and hardened environments. He wasn't easy on himself, and he was having fun while he was doing it. It's not about being tough on yourself. If you're not having fun in what you're doing, change jobs. I really advise it. Find a place where you're enjoying what you're doing. So get out. Do some wrong things daily. You will get things wrong, but you then will have to recover from them. Get things that are interesting and build a herd. And remember, it's not about the leader when you defend, it's about building a strong team. The biggest job of the leader is to find the right people for the team. So thanks very much. I now started an initiative called Cyber Escape together. I haven't started it. I'm now helping some guys doing that. They started it. I think it's a great initiative. We're going to go with that forward. It's called Cyber Escapes. We will get like-minded people together to have some fun, explore security from multiple sides, not just pen tests, not just crypto, but also some analyzing of data and actually speaking to people as well. If you want to link in with me, speak me Pechka, that's my name, proper name, call me Zibi, and that's my Twitter handle. So that's me. Thanks very much.